Okay, ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor and privilege to introduce you to my BFFFFFFF, Miss L. Burner. Round of applause. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having me. <laughs> you are more than welcome. I would like to tell you how this Michael Connected friendship began. So, back in 2005, the News Journal from Wilmington, Delaware, did a story about me and my love for Michael Jackson, my Michael Jackson collection. It ended up at first being a very small story. And then they called me back and said, you know, we wanna make this story a little bit bigger. Can we come back and take another set of pictures? And this time you lay all your stuff out on the floor. And I was like, oh my God, that sounds like a big task. But yes. of course I agree. So the news journal came back and this ended up being the story in the life section. Check this out. So that was a lot of Michael stuff on the floor. And I will say, the guy from the News Journal did offer to help me pick all those things up and put them back. But I said, no, 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 <laughs> please don't touch. I got it, she can tell you. I'd rather you just- I don't touch her <laughs> just, just let it go. <laughs> but the next day I had an email and he told me that three people had reached out to him and they wanted to have my information. They were local Michael Jackson fans who had saw the story. And he wanted to know if it would be okay to, you know, share the information. He said, I'll just give you their information and you can, you know, do whatever you please. Or, and I said, well, it can go both ways. You can give the other ladies my information. And uh, the first person was, uh, and I don't know the order in which they contacted me. I'm just going to tell you the story in this order. One of the ladies' names was Susan, Susan Smith. Now, at the time, <laughs> she always laughs at me. At the time, there was a very famous Susan Smith on the news who had just did some horrible things to her children. And I was freaking out like, there is no way I'm going to contact this Susan Smith lady. But I said, it can't be the same lady. It can't be. And it wasn't. It ended up being one of the sweetest people on planet Earth. Yes, our buddy Susan. Yeah, shout out to Susan. Hi, Susan. <laughs> and the second person was a young lady named Latifah. And I remember Latifah calling me very early in the morning and I was in bed. I have no idea what Latifah talked about. She was the fastest talker I had ever heard. I just love you so much because you're a Michael Jackson fan and I'm a Michael Jackson fan. I'm just so excited to meet you. And I just and I, just want to meet and I would love to come over and meet you sometime. And I, know, don't be, I mean, I'm not crazy, but I would like to come over. And I was like, oh my God. I was like, and again, she turned out to be one of the sweetest people ever. So, <laughs> you know. So then there was Miss L. And L will tell you her story about how she even saw the article. Well, yeah, this is very interesting. So I was working, um, working for uh, for a homeless shelter, and a, la a lady from um, where is she from? Belgium. Yes, Belgium. I miss her so much, Olivia. Wherever you are, shout out to you. She really kind of came to America just to kind of check out the culture. That's kind of what she explained to me. She lived on different continents, and husband was well off. She didn't even need to work, but she was working here at the shelter because she wanted to help and learn different things about our culture. So she thought things. She thought about things in a different way than we do. You know, she was very idealistic. So one of the things that she said to me in her idealistic mindset, and she doesn't know this is how I view her. I was always like, "Oh, you're so cute. You're so <laughs> sweet." That's that's not how we do it here in America. But she put the newspaper in front of me. And she said, this young lady's name is Vinay. You should contact her. She's going to be your best friend. That's crazy, isn't it? I was <laughs> like, um, okay. She said, no, she loves Michael. She's from right here. You should contact her. She handed me the paper. And I was like, these people don't know me. They're not going to. She was like, no, no, contact the reporter. Call the reporter. And I was like, I mean, what do I have to lose? So I went home. I called the reporter and said, could you put this lady in contact with me? Because I didn't want to violate. I thought it might make them uncomfortable if I answered right, her number. Right. And she called me. If not that day, then at least by the next day, she called me. And then within like 24 hours or 48 hours, boom, I was at her house. Yeah. I think, did you invite everybody or just or I was think, I the only one that showed up? I think up? the first time, the first initial meeting, I think, was me and you. Um, so, yeah, I had got the email while I was at work. And I said, well, I'll call her from work. That way, if she's crazy, <laughs> she won't have my home number or her caller ID. She'll just have the school that I was working at. So I called her, and she sounds so nice. And I was like, you know, I want to invite her over. So my other BFF outside of the Michael world, her name is Michelle. Shout out to Michelle Williams. I said, Michelle, I need your help. 
I'm inviting this lady to my house. She saw me in the newspaper. She's a Michael Jackson fan like me. She wants to come over. She might be out of her mind and I don't want to be here by myself. So could you come over and just hang <laughs> out? And if I feel safe, I'll give you like a, a nod or something to let you know it's okay to go. And then she had her own backup plan. <laughs> yes, I had I had my brother, even though I had a vehicle, I had my brother follow me over <laughs> and told him to stay in the vicinity because this lady might be crazy. <laughs> and if I if I text you and let you know that I'm safe, you can keep it moving. You don't have to worry about me anymore that night. So we both had this backup yeah, plan. Yeah, we had our... Because uh, is... people are crazy. So you got to, you know, people always smile at first and then, you know, they're stabbing you. So... <laughs> Once I felt comfortable, which really was right away, you know, it, I don't think it took long for me to give Michelle the, you can go nod, you know, um, and then we just had a really great time that first night. And one of the highlights um, I remember from that night was L had never heard uh, Big Boy, right? Yeah. Yes. And um, so tell us how that experience was and how it even came to be that I played it for you. Well, um, I had always heard that before the Jacksons were signed, that they made a recording, like I guess what we would call today indie artists or an indie label called Still Town, had made a 45 of a song called Big Boy. And even if you look at the book Moonwalker, um, is it Moonwalker or Moonwalk? Don't Moonwalk. Shoot me for it. Moonwalk, I always get that confused. So there's a picture of it in the, uh, in, in the book. And I used to always say, man, if I could get my hands on that. But you're talking about the 80s and 90s. That's still a record era, right? And then we didn't have the internet. Mm -hmm. So and it was only maybe, I think, 5,000 of those printed up or something like that. And I said, I'll never hear that in my life. But as though this is 2005, we're in the internet era. Everything is searchable or attainable, you know, just by that connection. She just, I brought it up and she's like, oh, I have a copy of that. And I was like, you are kidding me. And she <laughs> pulled it out and it was on CD. And I remember I was sitting on the floor in, in the house she called the Red Room. Her walls were painted red and her collection was probably half the size that it is now. But I'm sitting in the middle of this that this collection feeling inspired and I'm like, I'm gonna hear this song. And it was like this profound moment and it came on and then I heard it and it was kind of like, it had that rough sound, like like the way something would sound if it's in indie, you don't have the proper equipment to mix it. But I like that. That made it really authentic. Right, right. So his voice came on and then I realized, you know, like doing the math, that he was like seven, seven, maybe eight on that recording. It's talking about a year or two before Motown, you know, and I just listened to those pristine vocals and the song was beautiful. It did not mm -hmm. let me down. And um, I sat there and I just remember I started feeling so touched and so weak, like and my posture shifted and I'm just dropping my head. And before you know it, tears were pouring down my eyes and she just looked across the room. She was like, oh, and I was just <laughs> like, oh my God, I'm actually hearing Michael's first official recording right. like ever. And I, I, I just felt so privileged and I was like, yo, this girl got it going on. Like she got all kinds of stuff that, uh, you know, I never knew that were, that was attainable. Right. And I was like, you know, it just opened Pandora's box for me. Now, what was funny is, and I think this also happened in the first visit, um, Elle had brought over some CDs, I'm sorry, DVDs yes. for us to watch. Now, back then, I didn't know that there were like Australian bootleggers <laughs> and like all these places where you can get these DVDs ordered and made from. I just wasn't in the internet world like that. I kind of stayed in the MySpace and eBay area mm. and kind of just left it alone. So she came over with a pile of DVDs. And I was like, I've never seen any of these. And she was like, yeah, I got something to try. Right, I want one up there. Yeah, but this, I was like, are you serious? Oh, no. so where'd you get those? I'm not yeah, telling she you. Yeah, she wouldn't tell me. I was like, tell me where you got them from. Nope. She was like, this is the one thing you don't have, and I'm going to keep it that way. So I was like, well, show the Invincible CD signing, because I had never seen that before. So do you want to tell the story? <laughs> So I'm studying, she's sitting there looking at the Invincible CD signing. This is at Times Square, right? right. Um, what, what, was, what was the store? Virgin Mega Store. Virgin Mega Store. I know everybody's heard of that. So she's so cool and calm. I just remember she was sitting on lean. Like she was watching it like, <laughs> okay, okay. So I'm looking at it and I'm enjoying the fact that she's enjoying the video that I brought. And, and Mike enjoying was there. the fact that I don't own it. That's, yes, that's really I was like, was I was up. like, yeah, I was like, yep, just like you made me feel a big boy. See, I got something to bring to the table as well. So we're watching, we're like 15 minutes in. Michael's looking good, signing, hugging his fans and everything. And I was just like, yeah, isn't this like just to see him in this way is a different light because we used to see him perform, interview, 
or be given awards. Right. Pretty much right. what we see him doing all the time. But he was like right there with his fans and everything. And I'm like, this is so cool. This is so cool. So all of a sudden, the next person sign steps out the way. It's Renee in the video. <laughs> she says, oh, there I am. Just as nonchalant. She's like, hi, I'm, I'm Renee for Kick and Pop Fanatics. And Michael's like, oh, good to see you. I'm sitting in my chair. Yeah, she literally collapsed. Boom, I just, fell off. I just fell off my chair. She just could not stop laughing. She met her idol at a CD sign. Oh, good to see you. So the point of the story was she had this one thing that I didn't have, right? But then I ended up being in it, which, which was hilarious. And she said, why didn't you say anything? I honestly didn't know I was in it. I had never seen it before. So I honestly didn't think they would record all 500 people. So I didn't want to say in advance, oh, I might be in this. And I then think you that would have been appropriate. You know, so I, I was like, well, I'll just be quiet. And if I see myself, and I was like, oh, there's me. So <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you can't top that. I was like, me having it just couldn't trump her being there. And in fact, he's like, oh, good to see you. I'm like, yeah. really? He said it was good to see me. Really? But that video is already on YouTube. Yeah. Um, but anyway, we're going to take a quick little break just to show you some pictures of some of our early adventures because what ended up happening is we started doing Michael nights every Friday at my house. Me, Elle, oh, Susan, Latifah, our friend Jose. Sometimes we would have guests like her cousin Cord or um, Nene. Nay, Nay. My guy uh, I don't want to call her Nene. Yeah, my guy um, So we would have some people peek in, but it was really the core of us ladies. And um, here's some pictures of our early times together up until more recent. So as you can see in some of those pictures, we were very young and some are as recent as this past November when we were in Vegas for Elle's 50th birthday. So <laughs> this is 50. This Dot is 50. Com. Hey. <laughs> so as we became friends and as you know, time went on, we started to understand that our history was actually more intertwined than we could ever imagine and that we had more coincidences in our lives. It wasn't just our Michael connection. But it was a ton of crazy things. Yes. The first thing I'll share is I told you that there was a few people who contacted me from the news journal. And I left one of those people out of the story on purpose. There was a guy, I mean, I can say his name because I'm not going to say his last name. But there was a guy named Antonio that had wrote me a letter and was telling me, you know, he's a huge Michael fan. And he hopes that when he gets out of prison, <laughs> we can have a relationship. And if I want to know what kind of man he is, I could go around the corner to his sister's house. I have no idea how this guy got my address from prison. But one day I told Elle, I said, you know, this guy is stalking me from prison. I said, he, he's written me letters already. I said, he has called me more than 80 times. It's a whole to do. I actually hey. had, oh yeah, I actually wow. had to go through a whole thing where nobody can ever call me from the prison system. Like it was a whole thing I had to do to, to prevent that from happening. But when I told her that I'm getting stalked and harassed by this guy, Antonio, what was your response? <laughs> I've already been stalked by a guy named Antonio from prison. <laughs> and it happened probably like a year before I met her. The same last name. Now yeah. the funny thing is your guy wasn't in jail, right? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, no, yeah. It could have been the same guy. But we just thought it was so funny that we were both being, I mean, it's not funny, but we were both I being stalked <laughs> by this, the man with the exact same name at yeah. two different time periods. And then it started getting creepier. So you want to start? Well, for me, it started the night that I met her. And we were, um, we had listened to so many different songs and went through her collection. And we were sitting at the table. And I swear, I say this all the time. 
just something that I vibed in her. We were sitting there and, and then it got quiet for a minute. You know, you have like a, a so-called awkward silence, except it wasn't awkward to me. It was just silence. In that silence, we kind of were looking at each other from across the table. And I had this epiphany. I tell people that all the time. I said, I think I know the answers to the questions I'm about to ask. And I'm willing to bet that it's very similar to mine for some reason. I was like, I feel really connected to her. So I was like, and this this is it starts out typical, then becomes very atypical. So I'm like, it gets weird. It gets weird. <laughs> so I say, what's your sign? Sagittarius. Sagittarius. Oh, okay. Well, when's your birthday? November 30th. November 28th. Very, very close. Two days separate. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so then I said, what kind of car you drive? At the time I was driving a Jetta. At the time I was driving a Jetta. Weird. <laughs> so, where did you graduate? Wilmington, Wilmington High. High School. <laughs> so, then we're both in the human services field. And then we kind of veered off and ended up talking about different jobs we had. Well, I worked for an agency called uh, Each One Teach One. She volunteered with something called Each One Reach One. <laughs> <laughs> so, I worked at the library when I got out of high school. And I worked at the library while I was in middle school, but here's where it gets crazy. When I was in middle school, I had a secret stash in the back of the library of all the Michael Jackson magazines. It was a big pile and I was slowly, I don't want to use the word stealing. I was bringing them home to the rightful owner. <laughs> As was I from the library. <laughs> I was borrowing them in my head with the intent to give them back, including the albums. I'm not going to say which I never library. had any intent of taking them back. I felt like I probably might <laughs> <laughs> because I worked there. But I quit shortly after that and I realized there was really no repercussion. Um, so I didn't see any point. And I, I too felt like they rightfully belonged home with me. But my story actually is kind of like a sad, happy ending. So I worked in the library for sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. At the end of my eighth grade year, when I was about to go to high school, the librarian, all the magazines that were left of Michael, she actually wrapped them up and gave them to me as a gift. So all that time I had been taking them and she was gonna give them to me anyway. I felt so bad, but well, but anyway. I think it was prophetic. You said that you were the rightful <laughs> owner. So that's really So here's what's funny. Our girlfriend, Susan, who we mentioned earlier as one of the people that contacted me, we had become such a family and we were like, if Susan's birthday's coming up, let's just go all out. Let's have a little, you know, Michael celebration for Susan. We got a cake, we got some candles. And I said, uh, Elle, you like, <laughs> sorry, you like the candles. And your response was, I don't strike matches or mess with lighters. I'm afraid of open flame. And I don't like candles because we're both scared of fire. <laughs> so another odd coincidence that we found out unfortunately in real time as she was coming oh up the steps we're like we gotta like the we gotta like the cake it was hilarious now i will say i've gotten better because i do like my candles and I, I, now that i live here with ryan i do like the fireplace do you use but like one of those long i still yeah, it has to have a very distance. long striker yeah but you know that really wasn't popular or out back then yeah so I don't even know what we did. I think it was just no candles. We did something that just know. went terribly wrong. We, <laughs> we had those blow things. So we was like, we'll just make noise when she yeah. walks through the door. The kind of paper things so that said, they go up. Only two, three. three. <laughs> we <laughs> thought it had a horn on it. We thought it was going to go. Eh, but instead, she walked into the sound of unfolding it was, paper. It was nothing. <laughs> nothing happened. <laughs> and she made it clear that it was not a grand introduction. <laughs> It was, it was like, you guys thought that through. We had nothing. We had done. such good intentions, we Susan. Did. We really we, did. We, we love you, Susan. But we anyway, to do it. as we continue talking, I told her when I was going to Wilmington High School, where we both went, that I lived at 500 Homestead Road, which is in Wilmington, Delaware. And she lived... A 500 Homestead 500 Road. 500 Homestead Road. I, apparently, I moved and she shortly came. Yeah, it's so And crazy. we didn't know each other. So, all, so all of these things were happening. Yeah, it's like... <laughs> I always just missed her. So 500 Homestead Road was the address of an apartment complex. So I was 500 Homestead Road and I lived in D building. And she was 500 Homestead Road. Right, and I lived in A building. And so, then, we so we were really on the same lived route. about 200 feet apart. It's crazy. <laughs> so then um, one day she was talking about how obsessed she was with the old story, um, the Atlanta child murders. And that is something that she had always followed for, for many years. And I was like, oh my God, I'm obsessed with that. I just did a whole, what was it, like a... Diorama? Di di <laughs> a whole poster yeah. board of like all the victims in order. 
I had literally just did this for class. And yeah. she was like, you know, that was a special they had that was real good. It was on A&E. And I was like, oh, my God, I have it on VHS. Yeah. Let's watch it right now. Like everything that she had an interest in, even music. You know, we found out that we were both Shaka Khan fans. Yeah. So we ended up wanting to see Shaka yeah. Khan. Yeah. Um, right. My sister at the time was working for uh, Chrysler. And they had this big picnic at Great Adventure. And guess who was there? I was there because... We didn't I, know each other, though. I, and yet I <laughs> randomly went with some old friends I knew from childhood that I had recently reconnected with. So I just really wouldn't be there. I didn't know anybody working at Chrysler at that time. And we were apparently under the same pavilion, walking around, getting hot dogs and stuff, but hadn't met yet once again. <laughs> but then I, you know, when it, then I found out she had been in my brother's house planning a baby shower because my brother's yes. fiance's best friend is her daughter's aunt. <laughs> So she's like, I don't, I know these people. I, mean, I don't remember how we even connected right. those dots, but it just kept happening that we were passing through the same space without knowing each other until 2005. And, and just about everything <laughs> that happened to Elle happened to me after. So when I was hospitalized um, a few years ago for blood clots, um, which were pretty bad. I had one in my left leg and four clots in my lungs. Um, this, this chick over here says, tell them to check for... Cock-a-lock-a-lock-a-lock. And tight <laughs> dance. She was like a mysterious situation. They couldn't figure out where it was coming from. And I knew some things about her habits at home, things she had eaten, done, whatever t supplements, whatever she was taking. And I thought back, and then I said, I suggested to her, I said, you know what? You consume something that I know that can, you know, cause blood clots if you have a particular condition. I said, and it's called anti, it used to be called anti-cardiolipin syndrome. Now they call it anti I think phos phospholipid syndrome. It sounds like something like, like, like that. Like, to me. But, but it means short. that you, it means when certain things enter your body, she it clots. Right. It clots. Yeah. I thought <laughs> I was like on the phone with her, and I said, "Ask your doctor." He goes, "That's a great idea." We both said, <laughs> "Wow." And that's precisely we both have that same factor in our blood yes. where certain things will throw clots. The only difference is I was fortunate enough to find out before it happened because right. I had gotten testing. Bit, and it was this running joke when like I got pleurisy and she's like getting sick like a couple months later I was like you got pleurisy just go to the emergency room because it always happens like that yes so. and then so whatever she gets whatever disease she end up getting <laughs> I I usually follow suit I don't mean yeah. disease like that but any type of illness, illness yeah. and it's just been hilarious because it never ends like even all these years we've been friends since 2005 like we just found out that we were both Paula Abdul fanatics. Like, oh yeah, like we're, like we're constantly like <laughs> we're constantly finding out that we have we're literally like almost the same person, and our stories are so parallel to me and Ryan's. Like, there's so many times me and Ryan were in the same place at the same time and didn't know each other. And I just think that's amazing that when you consider all the Michael Jackson fans in the world, when you consider the ones that were placed in your life, mm -hmm. it's just pretty amazing. And um, I just thought it was worth sharing the story. Yeah, it really and, is. And um, I'm going to show you something really quick. Okay, so the reason why I chose to show you the pictures of Michael Jackson at the World Music Awards is because Elle was, was actually there. Yes. So share your story about that. So, um, shoot, I don't even know where to start. There's so many interesting angles that I could uh, use to begin. But I guess I'll start at the beginning. That makes the most sense, right? So, first of all, let me say, um, traveling out of this country to see Michael Jackson is not something that would have been a concept to me had I not met Verne. Because kind of, it's funny how you, you live within a paradigm, right? So, I thought it was impossible to get near Michael. I had attempted once um to go to the jackson family honors in vegas but then all that stuff happened in 93 and they canceled it and then i was like oh so you can't get next to michael it's just like even the thought beyond the victory tour because i missed that it's like i don't care what i try i'll never get next to michael when i met her and she had so many experiences i was like okay maybe it is attainable even if you have to do something crazy so after the trial I kept thinking, you know, and I said out loud, I think to Verne, well, the next place where he is, if he's, if there's an opportunity for me to be there, I'm going to go. I'm going to go. And I'm going to go for two reasons. One, because I just owe it to myself as a fan and I know it can be done now. And I also felt concerned that he might not be here much longer. I had that, that, that inkling because they put him through so much and I saw his life force draining it, if you will, like after the trial and that sort of thing. So I was like, I'm not missing him again. I need to see him. You know what I mean? I need to go and support him. 
Lo and behold, I get an email from something. I think she hooked me up with a fan club or something because ordinarily I wouldn't get an email. And they were like, hey, want to go see Michael in London? And I was like, yes, I do. I think I will. And I clicked <laughs> yes, on it. And I was like, what, what do I need to do? I had to get an emergency passport. How about I had like seven to 10 days? It was a very short period of time. I got in there. I booked my flight. And then I um, called up my cousin, uh, uh, Corey, Corey. He likes to go by Corey. Um, he is a big fan that we would bring around to some of our functions sometime. I was like, you want to go to London, see Michael Jackson? He's sarcastic. He goes, uh, okay. <laughs> I said, you need to come around here. We're going to book right now. So we finished booking the trip, got the passports. Next thing I know, we're really in London. And just about FYI, a I couldn't go with her because of the short notice, because I wouldn't have been able to get proper childcare for Nichelle in that short window. So I couldn't, I couldn't roll with her this time, just so you know. Yeah, yeah, it was, <laughs> it was really short for, for most people. You, most people thought I was crazy. They're like, you're gonna plan a trip to London in a week. And I was <laughs> like, I, I don't have, uh, an option. Right. <laughs> Should I tell them to push the awards back? I mean, that's where we're gonna <laughs> right. go. So I went to the World Music Awards and um, it was Oxford, London, and um, just a culture shock when we stepped out of the uh, the under the underground what they call the uh, tube. I think they call uh -huh, it the tube. They do. And when we stepped, and I was recording. I still have to get those converted, but I came out recording so that I could get the genuine, you know, culture shock reaction. You know what I mean? It was great. The architecture there is beautiful, and um, so first we were jet lagged. We went to bed or whatever then we got up like at night and decided that we were going to try and find Michael wherever he was and I don't know what our plan was because that's so silly when I think back about it but um we were walking around and we had Michael's stuff on and I told him maybe someone will say something to us right, you right. know so we were asking people like in the tube that sort of thing like do you know where Michael is do you know where Michael is and look we got bits and pieces and people were finally saying that he, he was staying at a hotel in a particular city so I was like, why not? Let's try it. Just hop back on the tube. So we went in that area and we're walking around. I was like, this is just so vague. And we're asking random people, do you know where Michael Jackson is? And people were, and people were like, what's Michael I was like, we came from Delaware. We, we need some results. So then our memorabilia, our um, t-shirts, I had on a big button, all of it, it paid off. So somebody comes by and goes, hee hee. And I'm like, hey, hey, your fan? And they were like, hey man. And I was like, where is he? Where is he? They're like, two blocks down around the corner. Like we were right there. Wow. I was like, yes, right where we got off. And we turned that corner and just saw a sea of fans. Oh my God. They were laying on the ground, feel, standing so. up. And it was like such a great experience because I hadn't ever experienced anything like that. So um, we ended up camping out there all night. Unfortunately, we never caught a glimpse of him. The fan said he had come back and forth mm -hmm. a couple of times, tossed t-shirts and everything. But I just like being in the atmosphere. When it got really late, somebody was playing like their phone. And I remember we were playing um, Heaven Can Wait. Oh, That's wow. one of the last things that I that I remember hearing before the phone died. And it was so soft, we had to be quiet because no one had a Bluetooth speaker. Right. So everybody didn't stay, but a good like 50, 60 people stayed. So it was kind of sparse and we were kind of chilly. And we kind of bonded with the fans. We we're just laying on each other just to Aww. stay warm. And we didn't even know these people, but it just, it's like, if it's Michael Love, it's like, it just feels it's like it's best. family. It's yeah. the best. So we just like, tell the angels love. We're yeah. just singing all softly and just kind of kumbaya moment. I know it seems corny, but yeah. I always admit. Anybody who's experienced it understands. Yes, trust me. yes. So trust um, me. the next day we uh, we got to the wars and everything and, um, it was madness. It's it's crazy because I remember um, just like thinking about it, being there in real time, and then what the people experienced at home. It looked crazy to people at home, but actually being in it, it was it was ridiculous. Because what was happening was like ten thousand people were stomping repeatedly, sometimes for up to five minutes, because they just wanted Michael. I don't care oh what God. came on that stage, they just wanted Michael. So you heard it, but it sounded like the rafters, like was the, like the whole place was gonna come down. And you were excited and then, like a little worried. And it was like, Michael, Michael. It was star-studded and they still wanted to see Michael. Chris Brown was there. Beyonce was there, Rihanna was there. Wow. Lindsay Lohan was there. I mean, it was, it was just crazy. And it was like, but all um, you heard was yeah, like you heard all of that stuff and everything, and he had on that black yes. designer outfit, that uh, when shorter saw the glitter pictures. jacket. Yes. yes, and um, when he came out, he was say he had his swag on. He came out, and I was like, man, that man can walk. You can't tell me <laughs> that man walks like a model. You know what I mean? So he came out and um, decided to toss that like ten thousand dollar jacket in yes. the audience, yes. and they ripped, they ripped it to shreds. Shreds. Yeah, so people were holding up little pieces. <laughs> that they had and it was quite interesting that we got to see this up close and personal i've heard the rumors 
But let me tell you, he was all over Beyonce. It was it was <laughs> bizarre. We, we kept looking at each other. It was almost as if he didn't realize the cameras were rolling or he figured they would cut around. And right. he kept going for her waistline. <laughs> and she was putting her hand like the polite lady. And then you could kind of hear her saying, stop. And it was so cute. He kept coming back at her and like wanting to whisper. She like that little, Beyonce. That little slick thing that Michael does when he's got all these whispers or whatever. And... We were just laughing about it because we was like, wow, he really does have a thing right. for her. You know, I didn't hear even more stories later or whatever. So that was a cute exchange and I felt privileged to watch that or whatever. And then um, he sang a little bit of We Are The World and he, he actually sang There's A Choice We're Making, which is kind of cool because mm -hmm. that goes up high. And then just to hear him hit that note and we were like, yes, he didn't crack or anything, whatever. And um, he was just there getting uh, like the Diamond Award, I think. Mm -hmm. But just to see him there, it was so... um. It was just so surreal because I'm recording and I'm looking and then I'm thinking and then I'm asking myself, am I in the middle of the dream? Right. And just the setup was fantastic. Like of an award show, it's like you're looking at graphics that are like three stories high. You know what wow. I mean? And then it's like they're cutting and doing it again and you don't expect that to be a right. part of it. Cut, go back and do it. She's like, what? I thought we were looking at this all <laughs> the way through. So just the award show, you know, itself. Chris Brown did an homage to Michael, actually. He didn't do his own stuff. He did Thriller. Um, slightly off key, but he did it. <laughs> slightly, he, slightly he, did, he, he did it. I mean, I can respect that, but it was just great. It was just great to be in that atmosphere. And I'm so glad that you had that experience because, you know, we all look back now in hindsight, you know, with Michael being gone and it's like, man, if I didn't take advantage of this particular moment, you know, you wouldn't have never, you know, seen him or anything. Yeah. Yes. And we were fortunate that we had some fun adventures together. Um, as far as our Michael parties, our, our celebrations. Um, but Vegas, MJ. Vegas, MJ. yes, yes. But yes. we also had, um, yeah, the Vegas experience was, let me show you when we met Joe Jackson, and then we're going to share uh, a final big story with you. So that was after Michael had been found uh, not guilty on all charges, by the way. Um, that was yes. at the Victory Vindication Party in Las Vegas. It was like a three-day event. And um, you saw the ticket stubs, too. I, I zoomed in on the ticket stub. And um, later on, down the line, when Michael passed away, I had got a call from, well, an email from CBS. And they had asked um, if they could follow me out to California. I'm not sure how they found me or got my information, but they said that they knew that I was going out there to the funeral service and they wanted to know if they could follow my story while I was out there. And I was hesitant because I knew it was going to be a painful experience to be out there, but I'm also a person who likes to capture moments and I knew how significant this funeral was going to be. And so I got my BFFFF on board. And thank you to Christine Griswold. Yes, thank you. She basically financially sponsored us to go out there yeah, that um, was beautiful. at the last minute. And so when we got out there, Troy Roberts, um, he interviewed us from the moment we got off the plane. It's from Dateline. From Dateline. And he, um, <laughs> <you'll>, <laughs> I'll see if I can show, hopefully show you this clip. He <laughs> wanted to know where we were staying and did we have tickets and, uh, I'll let you look at it. And her friend Chantel could use a little magic themselves. They arrived late last night from Delaware. Can we get your luggage? Uh, this is it. This is it? This is it. Yeah. They packed very lightly. You don't have a ticket? No. You don't have a place to stay? No. Do you have transportation? No. Late last night, Brene had given up on getting a ticket. Okay, I was thinking maybe over there. What she really needed. It's a little crowded here, huh? Was a plan. Yes, it's all closed. Oh. For hour after hour, Brene and Chantel wander the streets of Los Angeles looking for a way to get close to Michael Jackson. We just want to stand here and be a part of it. And they just keep pushing us away. And I know that they told us not to come, but I just want to go somewhere and pay my respects to him. And just be finished with this. This all hurts too much. 
Vernay and Chantel weren't so lucky. This was where we slept last night. <laughs> you slept here last <laughs> yeah. night? That was our bed last night. But Vernay was determined to make the best of this moment in history. We're on Los Angeles uh, for this event. Any way she could. It was stressful. It's, <laughs> we're exhausted, we're in pain, <laughs> but um, yeah, it was worth it. Okay, it was funny, but kind of sad. But anyway, this is the DVD of the program. And um, I'll zoom in on that at the end of the show. So our episode, this was for 48 Hours Mystery. Um, it was called Michael Jackson, <laughs> The Last Dance. It was on 7709, the date of air, which I believe was the funeral date. Yeah, excuse me. The <coughs> so um, they had actually followed us when we got off the plane. And then they followed us to... I don't know where we were going. I think we we're trying to get close to the Staples Center. And when we yeah. got off, oh, we had we to going. walk because everything was blocked off. I mean, I don't know. I just think the whole thing was so cruel because when you think about every other star, you look at Aaliyah and yeah. all these other stars who had all the fanfare and they came down the aisle and all the fans got to see them go that by. Was, and yeah. I just felt like because of all the allegations against Michael, I just felt like there was definitely some shit. It was he was there treated was badly. Yeah. yeah, I specifically remember. I don't know if you guys remember, especially if you're fans, or even if you remember. For days leading up to the funeral, on the news, they kept saying, "Stay home, exactly. Stay home. Don't come out. Stay home." And they kept and reiterating that you're not going to be able to get anywhere near the Staples right. Center. Basically, what they were trying to do is discourage the um, the number of people that they knew wanted to be there for Michael, whether yeah. you had tickets or not. You know, we would have took over that entire city. But all they did on the news was constantly discourage you from coming. Mm -hmm. So when we had got um, dropped off, we were so far away from the Staples Center that we had to walk to get close to the location. And the first thing we saw was this really tall building that had a slideshow of Michael yeah. Jackson. And we both just lost it. Yeah. I mean, we lost it. And I, I may or may show you that clip. I'm not sure how I feel about crying on TV again. But um, did they get? I, they didn't put that on Dateline, did they? They didn't show that clip of us crying on Dateline. Oh, you know what? I'm not sure if that. You're right. Yeah, they, that, they, I don't that know if that made it. it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I haven't watched this in a while. But um, and from there, our night just got crazier and crazier. Like everywhere we tried to go, you can't go here. Move back. You can't do this. And then we finally found a comfortable place to sit, and that was covered with ants. You remember? That? I didn't even remember <laughs> that. I think I was traumatized. <laughs> so the. <laughs> it, well, I guess you can tell from the clip. So what she's getting at is we didn't have any place to stay. I mean, we went there with... Nothing. With, yeah, we went there <laughs> winging it, by the, flying by the seat of our pants. It was important for us to be in the atmosphere. Right. And to, you know, pay our respects in that way. So we were walking around looking to hobo. Like, where can we sit and Yeah, we had no up, hotel or did, um, nothing. <laughs> maybe a throw blanket wrapped up in our bag or something like that. Mm -hmm. And um, we had some humorous moments in the midst of all of that because... Um, I mean, I, I, I'm sure all the color had drained out of our face at a point because when we, like she said, we lost it when we saw the, um, it was kind of almost like a jumbltron, a digital show on the side of yeah, a building. Yeah, it was pretty massive. Really, really tall yeah, building. And I remember we fell to the curb. Like we were just, couldn't even stand anymore. Mm -hmm. And that may sound crazy to some people, but at this point we don't, we don't care because- If you're watching this, it won't right. sound crazy. Exactly. Because <laughs> love is love and emotions are emotions. And he was a part of our right. our DNA in a sense and, and, and marked our milestones of our lives from the time, you know, well, for me from the womb, you know what I mean? And she's been like a super fan for so long. So it affects us, it impacts us in music. It does touch your soul. So. You know, he was family to us, and it was hurtful. So we just couldn't pretend that we weren't hurt, and we had to sit on that curb and get ourselves together. And I, I, I want to say they filmed for a while, but then fell back because I remember Troy getting on his phone, and I could hear him. He said, "Yeah, they really just fell apart." Did you realize that? I don't even remember. We yeah, were, we were zoned out. It, yeah. I mean, it was it was a difficult time, and it was very difficult to have cameras following you and and seeing your raw emotion. And it's one part in the video where I just get so frustrated. And I say, they just won't let us go anywhere. And, and that was what was so frustrating because Michael deserved better treatment. I know you can't accommodate the whole world that wanted to come, 
But this is the only celebrity that I can personally recall ever where yeah. people were discouraged, discouraged not to come. Yep. And the way that they had Los Angeles blocked, they made sure that they made it as uncomfortable and mm -hmm. impossible. It was probably as, a perimeter as of about two blocks. It was ridiculous. The Staples Center, so it was very sparse yeah. in there. It was cordoned off and then it was sparse, whereas you would normally see the crowd at least the size of a parade. It, we, you never right. got that density. Yeah. It was very you And we never got tickets. And hit the ground every time. We were one of three fans featured in this. The other two fans were able to get tickets. We never got tickets to the service. We watched from, I guess, across the street. We found that if we had went the other way, <laughs> it was, um, I don't know, like a overflow that way. But we were never able to figure out how to get over there. That's what we're saying. Everything was so blocked. Like, wherever you got dropped off is most likely the side where you stayed. So... And then they were saying you could have got tickets from uh, what was the state Dodger Stadium? I forgot the uh, name, but yeah, we didn't yeah, have yeah. transportation. But that was, yeah, that was really far. And from you know, we, were. we didn't know if we would be able to afford to get there and then get back. Yeah, they didn't so, have Uber back then. Yeah, there was, there no, was no Uber, Uber or Uber. Lyft. You <laughs> so, so it was it was a, a very painful, sad situation, and we ended up sleeping on the curb um, all night long. And I remember my cousin Ronald calling me and saying Michael's on his way there because I guess they were bringing the body, but Michael had actually went the other way. Well, oh, the driver's yeah, the back. I mean, yeah, the back. So he never came, his body never came by oh, us. Yeah, down the street. But even the anticipation of knowing that just set me in an uproar. But um, well, the while funny, we were walking, I yeah, was gonna yeah, say. Yeah, while we were walking, <laughs> um, we was, people was out there selling t-shirts and stuff like that. So. Like I said, we must have looked drained and mm -hmm. we had been crying or whatever. And sometimes that's visible or people's energy, you can pick up on it. So it was this lady, she was standing on the side, I guess she was hustling t-shirts or something like that. And she probably had noticed before we got to her that this camera crew was like in her face because they were literally in front of us. Right. And um, so the guy with the camera was walking backwards and then there was another guy who had his hand on his back walking forward to make sure he didn't crash. And that's kind of how they maneuvered that. But she thought it looked rude, right? Because we looked so sad. We and so all she sad. said, she, she, she just sees these people. This is one of them huge cameras, too. It's not like a little, the, the lens is this big. And if we cross it's the street, face. they cross the street. Yeah, if we, we go stop, back this way, they go back this way. So the cat, you know, they ran for, we were the story. Yeah, <laughs> and she didn't get that. So it was hilarious because she decided to speak up. So she kind of steps partially in the frame and she, the whole church lady kind of body language. She's like, leave them alone. alone. <laughs> Can't you see they're hurting? And every we just busted out laughing. We totally like had to cut because we needed that laugh because she was really just trying to protect us. She was just leave them alone. And so we were just like, yeah, it's okay. We're, we're together, you know. We're, but it was hilarious, and we needed that little. Yeah, um, yeah that was a nice. Ice we break. needed that little break. But um, you know what? What I want to get at with all of that is that um, it was an honor to experience that with you. Oh, because that's something Same that here. I don't think I could have handled by myself. I'm not sure if I would have been strong enough to deal with that level of pain yeah. and that level of frustration uh, without L. And, and vice versa, like, like we have that kind of kindred spirit right. thing going on to where we understand each other. And we both broke down at different times, right. you know what I mean? Right. I, and there was a point at the airport where I think she started crying and I had to kind of pet her up. <laughs> right. And there was a, a point where you know, something triggered me and she had to calm me down. And it's just the understanding that we have, our love for him. Exactly. And just our sensibilities as friends, how we really care about each other's emotions and are in tune. So it's a blessing. It's, and thank it you for was, having me. Oh, of because course, of course. She's fine. And we had a great driver named Ron. What was his name was Ron? I don't remember. I his think name. his name was Ron. I'll show you his picture at the end. Um, but what I want to say is um, because we did the story for CBS, they couldn't help us in any way. Like they couldn't get us a hotel room. They couldn't get us tickets because that was essentially the story. The story was you have these fans that are out here with nothing. And that was the story, if that makes sense. But after the um, funeral service, they did put us in a very nice room. They gave us a private driver, which ended up taking us around um, the Neverland area and Havenhurst area. Um, so they yes. did make up for it afterwards. I just want to make sure you understand why they didn't do it before. Um, the whole point of the story was our struggle right. during so, so this. Because they came back the next morning to see what we made 
of you know our situation. And right. Said, Where'd you sleep? Renee goes right, right there. there. <laughs> 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 to the street. So when they saw that we slept on the street, you know they definitely took care of us after. And then they sent sent us like I don't know. I think I ended up getting five of these DVDs from them. Um, I don't know where I did with all of them. Yeah. But uh, I know you got one, right? And I got. I think I got two. But um, I just want to say thank you to them for. Um, letting us be a part of the story even though our story was the most miserable and saddest of, of, of all of the stories yeah but, but we ended up we probably are the only ones that ended up getting put up and getting the driver yeah, because I mean, the other people have our own driver though yeah, yeah. the other people were settled they, yeah. they had some place to stay they even so took was, us past Latoya's house yeah. oh yeah yeah so um <laughs> yes yeah, so fun times fun times but anyway we're not going to keep you any longer <laughs> I just wanted to share with you my BFFFFFFL. We've had so many Michael experiences that we haven't even really touched the surface just for the sake of time. But just so you know, she's always there with me. She's always there helping me plan. You know, she was the, uh, what do you call it? The speaker or like the, the MC, the I MC guess. at my wedding. Um, you know, she's always my, my right hand man when I'm doing any type of Michael event. So I uh, just want to thank her for always being there to support us. And she's been a big supporter of me and Ryan and our relationship. Yeah. And thank you guys for having I look me. forward to doing many, many more things with Mrs. L. Burner. Thank you guys for having us. Thank you for having me and doing this wonderful YouTube channel. Thank you guys for your support. I mean, it's picking up so fast. Yes. I'm so proud of her. And she is, oh, a, she is a dynamo. She is a taskmaster. I mean, total can... side note, if you're an upcoming artist and you need representation, She's the one, okay? She can get hey. you the publicity that you need. She yes. can get you on Spotify. Whatever right. you need to do, whatever your music needs are, you better hit up L Burner. Yes, hit okay? me on IG. Yes. L Burner Media Specialist. L Burner Media That's Specialist. That's L Burner Media <laughs> Specialist. So thank you thank guys you for guys. watching. <laughs> Here's some extra pictures for you. Thanks.